so we'll just chat for a second. If sure. folks are just starting to see us on YouTube, we're going to wait a minute before we officially start on Facebook. So I'll give a, a formal welcome then. What room are you in, Hanji? Do you have a studio room or is that your bedroom? Um, I have a studio apartment. So that means like a, a big room. room doing everything. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask Michelle when it's live. Mm -hmm. And we'll do some questions from people watching towards the end. <laughs> sure. Is that audience, they could also ask in some questions about us? Yeah, at about 30 minutes, then I'll, I'll invite some questions. OK, oh. Michelle, we are live. Hello. We welcome people who are watching us. My name is Daniel Kellogg. I'm the president of Young Concert Artists. And today, we welcome Hanji Wong, a fabulous accordionist. And before we start talking to Hanji, I just want to say a brief word about Young Concert Artists. Our mission is to discover some fantastic young musicians and help them get their lives started in music. Some great soloists, composers, chamber musicians, and Hanji is the very first accordionist ever to join our roster. Hanji, welcome. Hi, Dan. Hi, everybody. So um, I wanted to send my regards here from Copenhagen, Denmark. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much for watching us. So that was my first question is, where are you? You are in Copenhagen? Yeah, I'm in Copenhagen, Denmark. And how long have you lived in Copenhagen? It's been about six and a half years. OK. And I happen to know that right before you were in Copenhagen, you were in New York City, because the very last performance that I attended was you playing with the Omer Quartet in a small house concert that Young Concert Artists sponsored on the Upper East Side. So I believe that was March 12th. And um, yeah. is that the last time that you played in front of an audience? Yeah, that was my last time to play a public concert. And then after that, I came back to Copenhagen in uh, March 14th. So I started my quarantine right after that concert. So it's been like nine weeks so far. Wow. And you were in the U.S. in the middle of a tour. And if I remember correctly, you were about to go from New York City to Palm Beach to play a concerto with YCA alum Gerard Shorts and the Palm Beach Symphony. And every day we were waiting to hear news about concerts and whether they would happen. So what was that like for you, just having everything suddenly change? Um, it's been quite kind of um, difficult for me because I'm always kind of looking forward to sharing the music and be ready to sharing the music with audience and with everybody and for me like to cancel the concert it's um yeah it's kind of difficult but i know in that moment everybody's health and um everybody should say stay safe and healthy that is the most important so i think that's kind of um predictable yeah how many more weeks did you have on your tour when you had to suddenly go back to Copenhagen? Uh, I have been touring in the United States from the beginning of January. So that means I have been traveling like two and a half months in, in the US. Wow, Hanji, you are somebody that, I, I don't know if you love traveling, but you give the impression that you love being on the road and getting in front of audiences and you light up in front of an audience. Is it exhausting to be on the road that long playing concerts? Um, partly, of course it is. But for me, it's more excited. Like every time I go from one destination to another, I'm always looking forward to meet new friends and to get new place, to know that, uh, the new places. And also like, I, I feel like to making, uh, to make the new friends, like to get to know somebody and even like visiting a new place. For example, like when I was in Colorado, I was able to have two, three days to go skiing in the <laughs> mountain. That was really fabulous. For me. Honey, I have to tell you, the office was very nervous when they saw pictures of you skiing. Um, <laughs> really? Have you been skiing before? Yeah, I did when I was quite young, but then uh, it's been some years I have never skied. Yeah. Now, you grew up in China. We were just talking about it before this uh, started, north of mm -hmm. Shanghai in a small city called Suzhou. Yeah, Suzhou. 
Suzhou. So where did you ski? Did you ski in China? No, my father, he was grow up uh, in north, uh, northeast part of China. So that part is connected with Russia. So uh, there was a lot of mountains and it's pretty cold during the winter. So uh, when I was quite young, my father brought me to his hometown and I have spent some time <laughs> ski and discovered the area. Well, I do hope that if you ski again, you will always protect your hands and your arms. Yeah. Um, but let's, I, I wanna start by talking about the accordion. I have a personal uh, admiration for the accordion because a composer that we both love, Sophie Gubaidalina, has written quite a bit of wonderful accordion music. And we'll talk about that later on. But it, in the United States, it is unusual to see an accordion player on a classical music stage. And yet, the accordion has a lot in common with other sort of uh, classical instruments like the keyboard. So first, could you give us a little understanding of how the accordion works? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the classical accordion, which I play, it reminds very much the possibilities um, um, of the piano. So for example, like I can use my 10 fingers almost as same as the pianist can does. Um, so that also including the range and octavas. And then, but the special things about the accordion, which we have the registers, you know, the registers is something as similar as uh, the organ registers. By changing sure. those registers, we could have the different volume or different colors of the sound. And another thing which very special of the accordion is that we have the bellows. That gives life of the instrument. And we often say that the bellow, it sounds like the soul of the accordion. Okay. So just to understand the bellows is sort of the air box and you squeeze it to send air through the pipes Mm -hmm. And so it does, in fact, function very much like an organ. Yeah, it is. But also, um, just give a few uh, points. So we are actually the reed instrument. So by through right. the air and then kind of vibrato with the reeds, right. and then that's how produce the sound. So we have a lot of relatives, for example, like harmonic, um, bandoneo, and even Chinese instrument shen. They're all like relatives of the accordion. Okay, and your left hand, your right hand is playing something that looks very much like a keyboard with all the white and black keys. What does your left hand play? The left hand has two different systems. And I know like in America, the most of people are knowing very well about this own papa system, which means uh, just by pressing one button, we can have either major, minor, or diminished chords just by pressing one button. Okay. But we also have a converter. When we change the converter in the left hand, we could get another system. That's how um, I often to use that system, like play the single notes. Um, and then uh, that that is like two systems in the left hand. Yeah, so that um, the single note system, which often to played in the classical and uh, professional music. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm following. So there's one way where the accordion works very simple and that is partly why so many folk traditions around the world can use the accordion because you can play chords quite easily, but then you can actually have the left hand be as technically versatile as the right hand. Now, I know that there's a fair amount of music that you play, which is not written first for accordion. It's what we would call a transcription. So how easy is it to transcribe something from the piano to the accordion? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much for mentioning it. Um, I would say um, the best transcriptions are the pieces, of course, written for piano, written for harpsichord, or perhaps written for organ. And also, I try to avoid the pieces which use too much pedals. For example, the music mm -hmm. from Odyssey, from Rachmaninoff, because we don't have that sound possibilities. We don't have the pedal. But um, instead of those kind of music, it's very similar or kind of way we can play easily adapted to accordion. It's like Bach, mm -hmm. like a 
Vladi and Ramo and even Haydn, which those kind of music has used less pedals. Yeah, so that but, kind of pieces are very well suited in the accordion. So just to help people understand, you're talking about the sustain pedal on the piano where you can mm -hmm. capture lots of sound. You do, of yeah. course, have sustain on the organ, organ, but you have to keep the key pressed down and you have yeah. to have air moving. So the sustain yeah. works very differently, which is why you're saying harpsichord music has mm -hmm. more adaptability for the accordion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So and I, also, yeah, sorry, just no, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead, Hanji. Yeah, I just um, I just thought yeah, there's another kind of always I was thinking might be challenging for accordionists to transcribe those classical pieces into accordion. It's that we have the bellows, so that means when we are playing the music, we have to to uh, to design where you are going to turn your bellows, and you better not let the audience to notice where you're changing your bellows. So that actually one of the points I was thinking it might be difficult or challenging to play something on the accordion. Right, it's almost, you know, on a, on a string instrument, you have to change bows and they work very hard to make that a seamless changing of bows. But in the accordion, wow, it's a really, it's a very different physical motion. Um, you know, there's a question here and then soon I wanna get to a first video clip so that people can really see you Play the accordion. Now I know that you grew up in China and you came to the accordion at a young age, but eventually when you got very serious about studying, it took you all the way to Europe. Why is that? Um, because my um, my professor when I was studied uh, in batch uh, in master in the Royal Danish Academy, so he I, I never actually even thought I'm going to study abroad, but then I attended some of the international competition and one of the international competitions I was attended, it was in Spain, and my professor, he was sitting in a jury, and then he heard me play, and then he came uh, to the backstage and he told me that like, I think according needs you. So if you want it, you can come to Europe to continue your journey of music, to even pursuing your dream as a musician. So um, after that, I decided came to Europe and continue studying with him. So that's how you got there six and a half years ago. Now that's quite a compliment that he says the accordion needs you. And <laughs> when I first began to, to get to know your work and hear you in concert, I thought the US needs you because in Europe, there is actually a rather rich tradition of very fine accordion players playing contemporary repertoire, playing in chamber settings, playing on stage, which is why composers like Sofia Gubadalina have written for the instrument. But in the United States, there's very little classical accordion playing. Is that right? Yeah, it's right. And we also, like one of my dreams, of course, I was always been talking that I want to even build up to academic education in the near future in the United States. That's also like one of my dreams. Yes, I think you'd make a fine addition to many conservatory faculties to help usher in a new generation of accordion players. So I have so many more questions, but I want to make sure that we can show some of your playing. So we will start with the Bach clip. Can you tell us what we're going to see? Uh, the video you are going to watch is I've played in last year and in the concert, I've played this C minor Patita by Johann Sebastian Bach. I have chosen this very interesting moment from his Patita, it's called Rondo. And then you can see this harpsichord um, feeling we've talked, adapt to the accordion. I feel like also the articulation and the sound quality of the instrument, you can very clearly to hear on the accordion in this piece. So that's why I've chosen it. All right, so we will hear the rondo from the C minor part T. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so that's the Rondo. And I want to um, mention to people that um, we are trying a new platform today for our streaming. And so I know that the audio is okay and the video is a little choppy. And we're doing our very best to make these broadcasts from home work very well. So we'll keep tweaking that. So if people couldn't see the details up close because of the video, we do encourage you to go check out Hanji's YouTube page and you can see just how fast her fingers are. Um, but that is fantastic performance, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, what makes a really great piece for you to play on stage? So I don't just mean what makes for a good accordion piece. What makes a piece of music something you're so excited to learn it, memorize it, and share it with an audience? Mm -hmm. I mean, if the piece if can let me find, especially the storytelling, or feel like painting a picture, those kind of feeling, or I can even, I want to share always something like, like my inner voice with audience. So if something I can tell them about my true feeling or can really kind of, especially I like something more in the depths. So something I can really discover my, my own um, thoughts and uh, my mind. And I could also share that process doing the music with audience. That kind of music would be the best option for me to play for audience in the concert, yeah. Okay, um, as I mentioned, the last performance I got to attend live was you playing with the Omer Quartet. It's a collaboration that formed after you joined the Young Concert Artist roster, is that correct? Yeah, it is. What do you like about chamber music? What's special about playing with those those folks, those fine players? Uh, we are very good friends, and we love to spend time together. And it's been such great pleasure to work with them. And we've also played a lot of concerts together. So instead of talking or chatting with each other, but by playing the musical instrument and use another way, which is like the music language on the stage to talking with each other, it's something we are truly enjoyed on the stage. Yeah. How did you learn chamber music? What's the repertoire that you began playing as a music student that helped you learn this great art form? Mm -hmm. I've also did a lot of transcriptions. Um, when I was younger, I did the duo, uh, accordion with violin and accordion with clarinet. So like I started from the duo set and I've done a lot of uh, tons of the music, which like written for piano and violin or piano and clarinet. And I even have done like some of my own transcriptions from uh, the varieties of music. So that is really inspiring and also kind of made the fundamental for me in, in like right now, current life, I have always have the great time to spend with uh, the musician friends. Well, I know that um, having heard you play with Omer Quartet live and on recording, it's just a wonderful sound, the accordion with the string quartet, really fantastic. Um, I didn't actually get to ask at the beginning, but could you tell us a little bit about what your quarantine has been like in Copenhagen these last nine weeks? Uh, for me, I feel like, because uh, I traveled a lot and I have always moving around. So in the beginning, when I came back to my home, I feel like kind of relaxed and enjoy to be at home in the first couple of weeks. But then after then, I felt like, I was felt a little bit lonely and isolated and I really miss the stage audience mm. and also the way communicating with audience on the stage. Like I really miss that. Uh, but fortunately I have my YC family. So to see everybody is doing something and to be able to have the opportunity offered by YCA to collaborate with other musicians that is a wonderful thing. And also it's really warms me up to know that someone behind the scene, behind the screen, to think about me and cares about me. That really like one of the best things during the quarantine when I was Ooh. thinking about it. Well, thank you. And that actually leads to something that I wanted to ask you about. We have um, been helping to create some little concerts for YCA Artists Online. And then we discovered that our composers wanted to be part of that. 
And so several of them right away said, well, let me write short pieces. So somebody wrote you a piece. Tell us about it. Yeah. I have been working a collaboration with YCA composer Catherine Bouch. And um, during the process, it's just like so fascinating to work with her because she's not only a talented, amazing composer, she's mm -hmm. also a wonderful friend. She has the warm heart and great personality. So we have so much fun to work together. And at the same time, the piece which she has written, the impromptu for Han Zhi, is such amazing and kind of have this Zen vibe and also meditation atmosphere of the piece. So I think that's also what we needed during the quarantine, during the pandemic time. And I have been enjoyed so much to play it and so and also record it. So um, I can't wait to share with, with, with you guys. Well, I know that it, it is already recorded and we will tell people about that in a minute, but how long did it, from when you first talked about the project to when you had the piece, how long was that? It's about three weeks. Three so weeks. It's pretty quickly, yeah. Yeah, and, and how long is the piece? Um, it's it's about five five minutes, a little bit more, five minutes and a half. And did you guys have a lot of back and forth interaction? I mean, I think this is Katie's first time writing for accordion. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So first, I have sent some of the music works I, I i i have played it and also i really liked it and then she took some inspirations from those works and then she sent me some sketches and then after i played the sketches i have made some few recordings sent back to her i said okay i really like this material and that material is so cool so maybe we can use some of the materials and then she decided to to choose from those materials to create the piece and of course, we have done like some Zoom meeting and also like sending the videos to each other, which is really helpful doing the collaboration. Well, it's it's interesting that um, with the YSA roster, we're seeing more collaboration and more connection between the artists right now than I think we've ever seen. And it's partly because people are hungry to do something and there are, you know, people are just ready to collaborate. So I would love it if um, somebody who's, helping me with the comments could put up a link. I think Hanji on your website, you have created a video where you and Katie talk to each other about this piece and then yeah. you have recorded the piece and there's a video of the piece itself. Yeah, um, the piece of itself, I decided to put it later because I wanted to make the, this premiere for uh, the gift concert to our presenters oh. and so I wanted to put it up after that premiere, online premiere. So, so the piece is not up yet, just the interview, is that right? Yes. So okay. everybody's able to find the link in my YouTube channel so you can watch the behind scenes stories uh, of the piece impromptu for Hanji with Catherine Bouch. And what, um, inviting Katie to write for the accordion for the first time, what were some things that you had to help her with or what were some of the challenges? Hmm. The challenges, because um, we are basically just talking um, through the Zoom or messengers. So sometimes may, when, when I'm making those uh, little bit detailed sound, like for example, she has used, she has discovered this amazing sound I have even not noticed before, like this ribs, just kind of uh, clip on the, the ribs of the bellows and then mm -hmm. this bellows with air button so <laughs> i don't think she barely can hear it because we don't i don't think zoom and also messengers can working very well but um so that might be a little bit difficult but we figured it out so sorry to help me understand almost like a percussion instrument your hand goes across the top of the bellows and gets sort of a percussive sound by rubbing across it that way well that makes sense katie loves sound she loves exploring sound and um, I, I'm thrilled for this project, and we'll talk about another collaboration in a little bit, but I wanna shift to the composer, Sophie Gubaidolina. Um, the accordion obviously has a very uh, solid place in sort of folk music or um, oral tradition music, music that's not written down. And it, it is in South America, it's in Eastern Europe, it's all over the place. And so 
Sofia Gubailina, who is a, a Russian composer, um, she knew what I guess we would call the bayon, the Russian button accordion, is that right? Yes. And so rather than treating it as a folk instrument, she treats the instrument in a very modern way. How would you describe Sofia Gubailina's music? <laughs> So I would say that she approached to the instrument by all possible and impossible ways. And then she has been very innovative to finding the new sounds uh, and effects in the instrument. And also she also really find um, those kind of effects or those kind of sound you can't really find in other instruments. So I have I have had this great pleasure to work with her on her De Profundis a couple of times. And it really amazed me that um, the way how she think about accordion as the breathing instrument, especially by using the bellows. So uh, for example, in the beginning of that De Profundis, she has used uh, this shivering uh, bellow shakes, like um, inhale and exhale, mm -hmm. and just by the uh, shaking the bellows. It's so amazing that there's no possibility to find in other instrument. Yeah. Well, you said some great things there. You said that she approaches the instrument with the possible and the impossible. And that really describes her. Every instrument she picks up, she wants to investigate how it makes sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so she uses all kinds of extended techniques. And then you also mentioned that she does a lot with um, breathing and the accordion. You know, we don't necessarily think of the accordion as a wind instrument, the way we think of clarinet and flute, but of course, it's just like the organ. Air is producing the sound. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the piece De Profundis. We're gonna play it at the end of the interview. Mm -hmm. The title De Profundis in English, that means out of depths. And um, it's being, it's been, um, she has written the piece from the 1970s mm -hmm. and uh, it's also inspired from the Bible. And there's a lot of, uh, there's like uh, the different, um, different part of the piece, which is she's um, created, also I think there's some like uh, Fibonacci numbers. And um, so the, the most fascinating thing in the piece for me is that except uh, those bellows breathing parts. I really like. I really like those. For example, like different clusters, tongue glissandos, and also there's some of the extreme dynamic mm -hmm. in the piece. So we kind of build up from beginning really out of deep, like kind of down somewhere very darkness, kind of scary, and going like huge dynamic to the top and ended up in the very beautiful and uh, this was hopeful and angel sound in the end. So that is something so fascinating and also make the piece so compact. And everybody the first time when they hear this piece, it's always kind of like breathing, breathtaking sort of feeling in the piece, which is like everything so connected to each other. Mm. Well, you described a lot of things about her music there. There's a drama and a contrast of very soft, intimate moments and very loud, violent moments. There's something about the notation that is very different than Bach. So Bach, all the notes are sort of written out, you know exactly what the rhythm and the pitches are. And often in Gubaidalina's music, she writes out what we would say is like a graphic score, or she writes a gesture that's abstract. And oftentimes there's no bar lines. So the pacing of the music is entirely up to you. How is it yeah. different to approach her music versus Bach? Uh, I think there's some similarities and I've mm -hmm. heard from her, she was saying uh, the timing is the most important, not only in the music, but also in the life. And she has mentioned this, every second matters in the music. So um, after I remembered from the deep profundities, after I first all of the details, and I have to make it more sort of um, to manage the time of the piece, because you might notice there's some like few seconds. She was written like 12 seconds of this part, oh, or yeah. like 
this three times little mountains drawing in the in this course but um eventually it turns out to something you have to really connect it somehow like naturally uh into the consideration but also i think in bach's music there's has some similarities as that even though it's not kind of necessary in the scores notation but i always feel like those kind of um uh, the post in the music which is like you keeps going in the box music and you have to find those kind of uh, also kind of connected a way of every bars in bars music and also you have to have this perspective uh, in in a piece which is you're not thinking about short terms but you're also thinking like a big um kind of perspective of the piece Yes, absolutely. Her music really needs a very large sense of shape and direction. You know, having seen you perform a few times, um, there's a, a focus and a presence that you bring to the stage. It's just everything else melts away and, and all that matters is the music you're sharing. And I see that same focus and, and brilliant intensity in both Gubay Delina and in older music like Bach. Is there something different for you when you're performing in front of an audience that is different than when you're performing to an empty hall or in the practice room? Uh, I feel like if there's audience, the real audience um, in the concert hall, I feel like uh, before I'm going on the stage, I feel like more excited than the empty hall or during the recording session. Because I know there's gonna someone is, uh, um they can hear like your inner voice and they can really really touched by the music itself and also as the one who's playing the music i finally find a way to kind of introduce and also to present the music uh, to kind of explain what's happening in the music i think that kind of feeling which is not really um possible in the other way could happen could ever happen yeah. okay well it certainly makes me hope that live audiences will come back sooner rather than later. Um, I know you're very active in creating lots of videos and you have videos of yourself playing with people in unexpected situations. Um, it seems like wherever you go, you're looking to make music with people. Is that a fair thing to say? Yes. Uh, for me, I always thinking about uh, what I can offer to people, what I can offer to every community I, I have ever been and doing the education programs when every times when I see uh, when I see the kids has the curiosities in their eyes, I feel like, wow, I want to do something. Mm -hmm. I really want to bring the joy and happiness in the music to people and the beauty of the music. And I also want the people not only focusing on what I'm doing, yeah, I'm recording this, but I want people to see the effect, the fact beyond I'm only playing the accordion, but rather than I'm playing the music. So that is my passion. And I want to, of course, to introduce more wonderful music to audience. I, you mentioned um, playing for kids, and I bet that they just light up when they see you play accordion because it, it's such a big and beautiful, bold sound and it's unusual. I bet they've never sat so close to an accordion player before. Um, yeah. Well, I was going to ask, I, I, what are some of the questions they ask you about the accordion? Uh, they have a lot of uh, very cute questions. So they, they, they have used to ask me like, oh, how much it weighs and how long your house it goes. And um, so they also notice like why you are moving sometimes different directions of your left hand and your right hand. So they're actually really paying attention when I was playing something to them. And also afterwards, all of them, I remember there's, there, there's quite a time the kids came to me and said, I'm going to ask my parents to buy me a accordion. <laughs> <laughs> Since you brought the question up, how much does the accordion weigh? Uh, I think it's about um, it's about 32 pounds. Yeah. Well, I've seen you go all over New York City with the accordion, and you must just get very used to it. It's just you're always going to have it with you. Yeah. Um, do you have any terrible uh, travel stories? Uh, let me think. 
I have there's a couple of times which when I was um get ready to to board on the plane and they might think this is this is not something as you know like cello or violin they used to see so there's always a little bit discussion during the uh, the time before boarding but I also got really um excited moment I remember in Austria um air flight when I fly from Belgrade to Copenhagen and um I remember the I think there's one of the cabin crew invited me to uh to the driving uh to to the I think it's yeah to the captains to the captains where they were sitting so I was able to sit there and talking about music and also kind of like see the great view <laughs> in the flight yeah well every instrumentalist has um their challenges and certainly for accordion it's just getting around the world with an accordion. Um, I wanted to ask you about your collaboration that's coming up with Stephen Banks, but before that, um, I'm able actually to see the questions on YouTube, but if there are questions on Facebook, I invite people to send those in and somebody will test, text them to me. So we have some time to invite Hanji to answer questions from anyone watching. So you and Stephen Banks, Stevens uh, is the new saxophonist on our roster. You guys have talked about collaborating. Tell us about what you're going to do. Um, it's so excited. I'm going to play some jazz music with him, and it's for me. It's a really big challenging because so far I have been working a lot of like classical and contemporary music, but I've never have been working with something the jazz and improvisation. So when he was proposal like the collaboration what we can do he has given me some op, um, options like we can play the classical stuff or if there's anything you want to do and i thought like i remembered he has this uh, background from jazz music so i said well i think i want to challenge myself i want to do something jazz with you and he's obviously also very excited about it so he sent me some links about the jazz music and then i we decided one of the theme we are going to do in next couple of weeks, and we are going to play the duo and in the uh, real jazz kind of style and set uh, to share this music with you guys. So, so what actually are you going to play? Is it a set piece or you're gonna um, improvise something? Yeah, we're going to improvise something. And that piece called Sandu, it's from a trumpet player, the jazz trumpet player, um, I think Clifford Brown. So um, yeah, so that piece is something, I, when I heard the theme, I felt like really, really enjoyed. And mm -hmm. I really like that piece with him. Mm -hmm. So how is the collaboration gonna work? You're going to, are you playing at the same time? Are you sharing files with each other? I'm going to record first. I'm going to play every single part and also my improvisation. And I could also do the bass line by my left hand. And then I send all of documents file to, to him. And then he could he could record based on that. I, I know Stephen has an idea that he'd like to collaborate with everyone on the roster if he could at Young Concert Artists. And then he wants to create a, an interview to talk about the collaboration, I think similar to what you and Katie Balch did. Um, I think that sounds fantastic. So when is this coming up? Is it next week or in a couple of weeks? I hope it's gonna be next week, yeah. Okay, I'm just checking the text to see if any questions have come in. I still have my own questions. So I know you are very active creating videos, and of course we're limited in the videos we can show today during the interview. So you have a very active YouTube page, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people would find you under Hanji Wong, is that right? It's my name. As and same as uh, Instagram account, it's the same name, Hanji Wong. And your Instagram account is fantastic because you're always putting up either great pictures um, or great videos and you always have a lovely message for people. Um, where else can people find you online? Um, I also have my personal website and um, I don't use Twitter that much. So um, I would say my personal website, YouTube and Instagram, that is the main three platforms I've been using. Okay. You know, my experience in this country is that 
there are people who haven't heard an accordion in a concert in a classical music setting and they're a little skeptical and then they hear you and they just they light up they think it's a beautiful sound you're really a virtuosic player filled with expressivity um and they're basically instantly won over you make instant converts to be fans of the accordion but i know that you have sort of a challenging path ahead because there isn't a clear way to have a classical career unfold what are some things that you hope for your own career thank you i think that is a really great question and for me partly i would say i'm working on some transcriptions and i do love um the baroque music especially from bach i have mm. been thinking about next project is going to be something related to Bach and at the same time I really wanted to do more collaboration with American composers or um, it can be also some other composers from other countries but I wanted to create more original works for the accordion and also for the future for the accordion. So um, I know it might come a little bit late to the music history, but doesn't mean it's not, uh, there's some weakness about the instrument. So I hope there's like more and more people or composers would see the potential of the instrument and create and compose more pieces for the instrument. And I do love also enjoy to play accordion concerto for example, I've played this fuck work by Gubaidulina last year in Oregon Music Festival. So I, I really enjoyed the experience and I wish there's also can be like according concertos in the near future. You and I have brainstormed about that, trying to think what American composer could write you a fabulous 30 minute concerto. And we have to keep working on that. I think you're right. Not only does do you need more repertoire, but you can pave the way for all sorts of accordion players to come after. Um, what are some upcoming projects for you this summer? I mean, what does your summer look like? Um, I before, uh, before this, all of this lockdown thing, I, mm -hmm. I will have like, some of really excited concert, but I think all of the concerts so far has been canceled. Mm -hmm. So my plan is if, the flights is still uh, operating by the air company. I could able to come back to my hometown to visit my family and spend some really nice home time with them. And it's been quite a while since last time I came back to see them. Okay, that's great that you hopefully will see your family. And in this time of quarantine, what have you been doing that's not musical? What, what have you been enjoying outside of practicing? <laughs> I have been uh, doing quite well. And then in the morning, I'm always doing my morning yoga. I'm a very, um, I like doing some exercise with kind of slow movement. So I kept the morning exercise routine doing the yoga. And then I tried different uh, recipes of um, cooking. I have cooked okay. a lot. And um, I also have a list for every week for example, I have named a week, for example, like Mozart week. And huh? I listen to all of the pieces for Mozart. And next week, I named it Beethoven week. And I listen to a lot of pieces which I have never heard before. And at the same time, I also have the reading list for the week. So like there's might be few books I want to read, even though I can't finish it in a week. But it's, it's still always kind of good to just start it a few pages. And then you find the motivation continue. And then I also have um, the week of uh, watching uh, documentaries and movies because I truly love to watch all kinds of documentary that also like really became my inspirations when when I'm making some um, videos like mm. sometimes. So um, I love to watch documentaries and movies and there's also a list for a week. So I have been watching quite some of those. You are very organized. I remember that every time you and I sit down to talk over coffee, you have a notebook and you're always writing things down. If I say, have you heard of this composer? By the next day, you've listened to the composer. I love that you are so curious and uh, pursue new things. So because you just said you've been watching documentaries, anything to recommend that you've seen recently? Yeah, just let me grab my- Your uh, notebook. <laughs> So I, I have actually two of documentaries I would say is very nice to watch and 
everybody is going to love it. One is called Made in America. So, made in America. Um, yeah, Made in America. Another okay. one is the Elephant Queen. So something it's more about industry, and another thing it's more about nature. And these two documentaries is been amongst other documentaries I, I I've been watching during the quarantine. I think it's quite interesting to watch. Tell me the name of the second one one more time. What was the second one called? The second one is The Elephant Queen. The Elephant Queen. The Elephant Queen. Okay, so Made in America and The Elephant Queen. We'll call this episode Hanji Recommends Documentaries. Um, in a minute, we're going to wrap it up and play some of the Goodbye Lena. I wanted to tell people a little bit about young concert artists. So as an organization, we look for people like Hanji, people who are ready to begin a, a long career on stage playing for audiences around the world. We have international auditions every fall that culminate in November, and then we take a very few number of people onto our roster and give them debut concerts and concert management and career guidance. And um, Hanji, it has been so fantastic to have you on the roster. Everybody in the office just lights up when they know you're coming by. Your enthusiasm, your passion, and of course, when you get on stage, it's just really magnificent. So um, we can find you on your website. I encourage people to look up some of the YouTube videos. We have a premiere coming up with Katie Balch. We'll have that online pretty soon, but people can already watch the interview that you did together. And then another collaboration coming up with um, Stephen. I know that you have one CD of new works for the accordion by European composers. Is that right? That's right. And that's on the Noxos label. And what's the name of that recording? Uh, the title of the album is On the Path to Hans Christian Andersen. So all of the pieces um, inspired by the fairy tale from the Danish fairy tale writer Hans Christian Andersen. And you will find this fascinating and very unique sound from the accordion and also all of the works originally written for the accordion. And I know that someday you would love to record an album of American composers with new pieces for accordion. So to anybody listening, we're planting the seed that Hanji is ready to commission and get new pieces for accordion. Well, anything to wrap up with today? Do you want to tell us a little bit? Uh, so we're going to hear some of the of De Profundis. And again, the translation is Out of the Depths. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think you invited me to play from about five minutes in. Um, Sorry, my mouse died. Um, any last parting words before we move it over to the Kubadolina clip? I would also like to promote one live stream concert I'm going to do in June 13th um, with the mainly Mozart Festival. And I'm going to do a live concert that day. And I'm also going to talk more about my instrument during the concert. So, so June? Have, yeah. June 13th, and June 13th. we could find it at the mostly, no, mainly Mozart Festival okay. in California. Yeah. And what yeah. time is that performance? Do you remember? Um, I think, um, wait, it might, I, I might need to change time though, but because okay. uh, it's going to be quite late for European time. So I hope to, to be a little bit earlier than the time we have settled. So that you don't have to do a concert at 2 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can tell people if you get the YCA weekly email on Tuesdays, we will include the information. We would love to collect people's uh, email address so we can make sure that we can share all the videos that we're talking about. And you could sign up at uh, www.yca.org. So Hanji, thank you. It's wonderful to talk with you. We hope you continue to be well and safe. And I can't wait to see you on stage again, hopefully soon. Take care and stay healthy and be safe. Well, thank you. So I will, give me a second, I'm gonna go over to the Goodbye to Lena and, um, and then that's how we will end our broadcast. So thank you everybody for watching.